Well, I had to share with one of my husband's favorite. I think I've told it one, two, three, four, five times. I think I just, the last March was the last time, so if you remember it, laugh anyways. A big city California lawyer went dunk, dunk, duck hunting in rural Texas. He shot and dropped a duck, but it fell into a farmer's field on the other side of a fence for where the lawyer shot. As the lawyer started to climb over the fence, an elderly far farmer drove up in his tractor and asked him just what the heck he thought he was doing. The lawyer responded, I shot a duck and it fell into this field and now I'm going to retrieve it. Ho, 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 ho. You just hold on and then burn a minute. This is my property and there's no way you're coming over that fence. The indignant lawyer said, I am one of the best trial lawyers in the United States, and if you don't let me get that duck, I'll sue you and take everything you own. The old farmer smiled and said, well, apparently you don't know how we do things down here in Texas. We settle small disagreements like this with the Texas three kick rule. The lawyer asked, who is the tech? What is the Texas three kick rule? Well, the farmer replied, well, first I kick you three times, and then you kick me three times, and so on, back and forth, until someone gives. The attorney quickly thought about the proposal, decided that he could easily take that old cut. He agreed to abide by the local custom. The old farmer slowly climbed down the tractor and ambled up to the city of Sewick. City slicker. His first kick planted the toe of his heavy work boot into the lawyer's shins, causing him to hop on one foot. His second kick knocked the man right off his feet. With the lawyer flat on his back, the farmer's third kick caused him to see stars. The lawyer summoned, summoned every bit of his will. He managed to get to his feet and said, okay, you old coot, now it's my turn. The old farmer smiled and said, no way, mister, I give up. You can have the duck. <laughs> I think I'm going to stop it. spoiled, <clears throat> spotted a vicious looking bear. The first lawyer immediately opened his briefcase, pulled out a pair of sneakers, and started putting them on. The second lawyer looked at him and said, you're crazy. You'll never be able to outrun that bear. I don't have to, the first lawyer replied. I just have to outrun you. <laughs> Get that thing up there again. <laughs> Pastor JC, we're having 20 more of those kids coming next Tuesday. So, it'll be fun, huh? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we just thank you, God. You are so awesome. No, God, we just pray, oh God, for your anointing tonight and may your word come alive. Help us to really hear what you're communicating to us so that we can walk in the truth that we hear tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You know, for a long time, my favorite word was hope. H-O-P-E. I love the word hope. I don't mean I hope it's not going to rain. I mean uh, the assurance that we have as Christians, knowing that God has been faithful in the past, and I know he's going to do it in the future. Amen. And being a typical woman, I like that security. And I always like the word hope. When I was confirmed in the Lutheran Church, and by the way, I was very... Uh, in love with Jesus, and I had a very faithful pastor who taught me the word of God. Amen? He's 95 years old, and we're still in touch. I was 12 years old, and he picks out the verses for him, and I remember kneeling there at the altar, and he put his hand on my head, and he says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And little did he know how important that verse was for me. But you know, as I was looking through the Word of God and studying, I came across a new word that I like, well, not, not better than hope, but I have another favorite word. 
And that word is peace. Peace. Uh, grace and peace from God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter and Paul both use that many times in their letters. Jesus said what? Peace I leave with you, remember? My peace I give you, not like the world give out, but I give you something different. Philippians 4, 6. And the peace that what surpasses all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Put the first one up. Shalom. I think perhaps there's many Jewish people that probably use shalom as they greet people or say goodbye. Shalom, shalom, shalom. I'm going to have trouble tonight. Shalom, shalom. shalom. That almost like when we say, hi, how are you? We never wait around to hear what they had to say. You know, just kind of second hand. But, you know, as I looked into the word, shalom just really hit me. And it comes from the root word that conveys the image of wholeness, unity, and harmony. And, and something that is complete and sound. And it is relational. It's, it's something between two people or, or man and God. And that's what we're talking about. But it's more than just peace. And I think that's another reason why I've never respected peace. Because I was one of those... Um, anti-war people during the Vietnam era, you know, the peace, brother, peace, and that was not the same shalom that I learned about this week. And it, convey, it conveys the idea of prosperity, health, and fulfillment as well. Peace. 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 Um, shalom was at its Maps we saw last week. Let's go to the second slide. In Revelation 21, 1, Jesus said, or, or John said, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Isn't that interesting that he would say the old is gone, and then he just tags on the end, and there was no more sea. Well, unless you understand how the Jewish people or the Hebrew language looked at the word sea, you wouldn't get the meaning of that. But the sea to them meant turmoil. It means, it means sorrow. It means unrest. You know, this type of thing. Out of Psalms 46, 1 through 4, it kind of shows you this. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, here it comes, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Do you sense the unsettledness? Do you sense the, 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 the incompleteness? Do you sense the, the, um, the turmoil of a, of a raging sea? Jesus said what? Peace. Be still, and the sea was calm. Remember, the word um, the word sea then reflects turmoil. It reflects all those things. This reminds me of a song. Um, it is well with my soul, though peace like a river, though peace like a river. I tend to fly away those storm, storms. You know, if peace like a river, I tend my way. When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Do you know the background of that song? Some of you might. In the late 1800s, a man by the name of Horatio Spafford, um, lived in Boston, had a wife, had lost a little boy in childbirth, but now he had five, four beautiful children and a lovely wife. Chicago was hit by a fire, and it really devastated his business. They had plans to go to Europe, and the fire hit. So he said, Anna, I want you and the children to go ahead on this boat, and he went on a French shipping boat, uh, French uh, liner, and they're on their way to Europe. And he stayed behind, and he was going to catch the next uh, the next ship. 
They were out in the sea, and the ship hit another ship. And within 14 or 12 minutes, the ship went down. Anna was able to somehow hang on to something, and she was saved. But all four of the babies went down. Stafford finally got word back from his wife in Wales. All it said was, I'm the only one. He makes his way now to go to his wife in Wales. And as he's on this liner, he's crossing the ocean. The captain says, it's here. And he pointed to the exact spot where those four babies drowned. And it is there that he wrote those beautiful songs. When peace like a river attends my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, wherever my life lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Amen, amen. All right, let's take a look at the next one. We also see that we're still in Revelation, just thinking about this whole idea of peace. Remember, this is, this is the end of the book. This is the climax. This is the, the, the conclusion of the whole matter. Our life with Christ in the new heaven and new earth. And it says here, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And then he who has sat on the throne said, Behold, I make everything new. Notice the line where he says, he said, um, I'm going to dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. You sense that peace, that unity, that harmony between the two. This is what I, I just picked up in my heart. The fulfillment of that. Take the next slide. When we take a look at peace, and I'm, I'm stressing this because I want you to grasp this. This peace we're talking about is between God and man. It's that which dwells within man and it's the peace that's to be between one man and another man, between us, among us. Um, God pours down his love and his blessings and his grace, and then what do we do? We respond in praise and thanksgiving, and we see that peace that is established between ourselves and God. There's that closeness. There's that There's that openness. Tonight we sang, we're his child, and he, like a father, welcomes us. He, he takes and he shadows us under his wings. We sense that. We have that peaceful relationship with God. Also, when we're talking about peace, he's talking about the wholeness within. Within. Those of you who know the peace of God have the peace within <coughs> There's something that kind of puts things back together, puts things right back in order. You know, it's not like holding on to the past and worrying about the future. That peace is that wholeness, it's that, it's that togetherness, it's that completeness, it's the serenity that we have within. That's the shalom that we have within. And how many know it's the peace that goes amongst us? This is the epitome of what God is talking about when he talks about shalom and peace. Peace within, peace with him, and peace with one another. And at the end of the book, in the end of uh, the revelation, we see that taking place. We are all together in him. Next slide. But I think that one thing that shows you that shalom is described to the max, as I would like to say, is this one. Revelation 22, 3. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, which means the New Jerusalem is going to live with us. 
and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. Serve him, see his face, his name shall be on their foreheads. That was very heavy and deep for the Jewish mind. This is a beautiful picture of the peace that we are going to experience when we see him as he is. In Numbers 6, 24 and 26, it says, this is the benediction, the closing prayer, the blessing that Aaron gave upon his people. And he would say this, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord what? Make his face shine upon you and be gracious you. And now he's going to restate it again in a different way. The Lord up his, lift up his countenance, his face, upon you and give you what? Peace. 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 Psalm 17, 8 says, keep me as the apple of the eye. This peace that God is talking about between you and him, listen carefully. It is an intimacy where you are face to face with him so that he can see his reflection in the pupil of your eye and you can see your reflection in the pupil of his eye. That's what the Hebrew writer is talking about. This is the peace that he's talking about. This is the peace that we're going to experience in the book of Revelation when everything's done. Him, inside, and with each other. But if you look carefully at this, and I am going to get to Genesis, by the way, in my assignment. If you look carefully at this, something caught my eye. If you saw the end of the book and just read Revelation, or you just heard me talk to you tonight about how wonderful it's going to be, it's like, yes! and you had no idea about how we got there, you might question this verse. Look at the first line. And there shall be what? No more curse. Does that not presuppose that there was a curse? Does not that suppose, it? the next one please. And because of that, you're going to see that you're not going to have the blessing of God, the closeness, but a curse means judgment. It's either blessings or cursings. Blessed are you, cursed be you. There was a time when there was a curse, and it wasn't blessing be, blessed be, it was judgment be to you. And as a result of that, they didn't serve him like the like they mentioned it in the last book. They rebelled against him. They did not see his face. No, you know why? They don't want to see his face. They're rebellious, they're away from God, they're under a curse. Talk to my hand, God, I'm gonna do my thing my way. And his name was not on their foreheads. The farthest thing that they have that they're gonna think about is not Jesus or God or what God is all about. Their mind is going to be elsewhere. Amen? Amen. Amen. Does that kind of describe something today? Do you run into people like appear to be anti, talk to my hand, I don't want to hear about your thing, and all of this? This is something that we know about to be true. Well, this is what we see what we're going to achieve or have at the end. But now we realize that there was a time when that shalom was shattered. We all know the Bible begins, in the beginning God created the heavens and earth. And we also know, would you read Louisa, please? Um, and they also, we also know 
that man was created in the image of God. We also know that man and God were in a peaceful relationship. They knew what shalom was. God walked with them. This is all anthropomorphic. That means using human terminology for you to understand something that's beyond our understanding. Okay? God's a spirit. But he's talking about an intimacy here. They had a closeness. The man and God were complete. They saw, I'm sure, looked into their eyes at each other. They were, there was joy. There was completeness. There was joy. There was happiness. And Adam and Eve... They were complete within. They had peace within. They were naked and didn't get any difference. They had no guilt, no. Everything was perfect. Peace within. And a demonstrated peace with each other. Each other. But we know that God coveted in Genesis 2, 15 and 17. I need to turn there. God made a covenant with man, which means he had a special agreement with man. And he said, you know, all of this is yours. I'm going to have you help me take care of all of this. Be a co-regent with me. Can you imagine the peace, the peace that those two experienced in the presence of God? All he said was, eat of anything you want, help take care of it, but there's one tree that I don't want you to eat of. And how many know that one tree is where the source of the shattering of that peace came? Can you imagine if you right now experienced the fullness of God's peace like we will when we see him face to face. And then the thought of wanting to do something that would shatter that peace. That's what they did. And we know that that the covenant was broken. Genesis 3, 8 through 11, it talks about how then came the curse of sin. And of course, as a result of that sin, death was the sentence. And Adam and Eve flee from God. They realize they're naked and they buy the blame game. Put the next slide up. In the midst of all of this, listen carefully, my friends. In the midst of all this rebellion, in the midst of them doing this unforeseenable thing. God. Not that one. <laughs> Number seven. Thank you. Um, that you see that God is a God of grace. He's a God of peace. He is not going to just sit back and say, well, I'll show you. You blew it. You're out of here. And by the way, I don't have time to talk about it now, but he was not caught off guard. He didn't, in Ephesians chapter 1, it talks about before the world was ever made, he had a plan. He had a plan to deal with the curse, to make Jesus Christ the curse for us. He had a plan. He knew this was going to happen. But now you see, even, I want you to realize this, as we go through the Bible, that God is holy and God is just and he is going to carry out what he says. But he also is a God of grace, mercy, and one who is seeking peace with his people. Amen. So you look at this. Adam and Eve, they flee from God. There's no peace, no fellowship. They expect judgment. And what happens? The God of peace, he comes looking for them. You're not going to come to me? I'm going to go find you. They really it. They don't have any peace in, in, and they have no sense of completeness. Okay? What does he do? He makes tunics of skins to cover their nakedness. And then 
the big one, they had to bear the curse of sin, death and separation from God. He didn't come and rub their nose in it. What did he do? He, he shared a plan to restore the blessings and the eternal peace. And we see that in Genesis 3.15, words to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your heel, and you shall bruise his head. And he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To foreshadowing of Jesus, the solution to the broken, broken, shattered peace that man has found himself in. Well, you know, um, those of you who read the Bible realize that it's all downhill now. All downhill. The opposite of everything I told you that peace brings is, is manifested. Cain kills Abel, first murder. And that just gets worse. Amen. Spirals down. Lemon brags about being boss over several wives. <clears throat> Mass murder doesn't care. You can just see it going down, 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 down. But like I told you, there's, there's discord, no peace. My friends, when there's no peace with God, there's no peace inside, there's no peace with each other. That's exactly what we see happening. But God. But God. Genesis 6, 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of their heart were only evil continually. Whoa. Without peace, what do you expect, right? That's exactly what you... Don't be surprised what the heathen will do. They do not have the peace of God. They don't have that wholeness. They don't have a relationship. They don't have it inside. Don't be surprised if they steal and kill and do. Don't be surprised if they're going to seek anything they can to get some kind of peace. This is the result of the shattered peace in the garden. Genesis 6, 7, I will destroy man whom I have created in the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things, birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But we also learn in Genesis chapter um, 6, I believe it is, we're introduced to a, another child that was born to Adam and Eve, and his name was Seth. And Seth's line goes a little differently than the Cain line. And the Seth line, they still sinners, they're still going to die. But there's something different about that line. You'll find people like Enoch. It says, born on the line of Seth, Enoch walked with God. Walked with God. He had shalom with God. Amen. And we know what happened. They couldn't find him. Why? Because God took him. Amen. There you see an example of a light. They had peace with God. Well, you keep on going on down a little farther, and you find out a man by the name of who but Noah. And it says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He was a just man, perfect in his generation. He walked with God. He was righteous man, blameless in his generation. Doesn't mean he was didn't commit a sin. He was different. He had a relationship with God. And God was gracious to him. And you know what? He was obedient. And what did he do? He was the one that God chose to redeem, to save, to keep, so that through his seed, the promised Messiah would come. And you know the story of Noah's Ark, which was probably a lot different shape than what you see in the storybook. And we know what happened. The rain came and the people were warned and warned and warned. Remember the end of the book? They're yeah, warned and warned and warned. We got a road of peace for you. You want some peace? Talk to my hand. We don't want any other stuff. Well, that's exactly what happened there. 
Jesus said, but as the days before the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Shalom. Little interesting ending to the story of Noah. And we won't go into all the details. You know them or you can read them yourself. We all heard about the rainbow. Now you can put the rainbow on. Very good. And you know, it's, it's interesting because this was a sign of God's promised covenant. He promised the people that he would never destroy the entire world through water again. And there were other things that he did come in with, Abe, with uh, Noah and so forth. But I thought it was fascinating that the rainbow is like a bow as a bow and arrow. Okay? I will put my bow in the sky. And God's bow is hung pointed where? Away from us. Away from the earth. And this is a symbol that declares what? God's peace. God's peace. Oh, my friends, I just pray it's not just another day that you just sit here and eat your little chips while I'm teaching and fall asleep. <laughs> People who don't have peace act that way. <laughs> Ephesians 2, 13 and 14. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Why? For he is what? Our peace. And those who've been in the program know this one. Having been justified by faith, Romans 5.1. Having been justified by faith. What does that mean? That means that the curse that Jesus took for you and the penalty that comes with it, he took it for you. So now you stand before a holy God pure and clean, not because yourself, but because you have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Amen. So having been justified by faith, what do you have? You have what? Peace. Not this kind of peace, but it's this kind of peace. With God. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you people are living as if you have no peace. You don't have peace within you. You don't have peace with each other. You fight and you squall. You, you have a problem with people. I question the peace you have with God. In these last days, there's going to be a great falling away. It's when you get calloused and you just come to church and you sit in the pew maybe because you have to or whatever. But my heart is heavy. Because the God of peace wants you to realize that you are in his kingdom now. Amen. And although you're in the world, you are still here in his kingdom now. You have that peace with God. You have the wholeness inside the peace of God that's in you. You have wholeness. You have purpose. And you have that shalom that peace amongst each other. Jesus said, love one another. Heavenly Father, I just pray, God, earnestly, God, earnestly, God, that the word shalom and peace might become a favorite word for all of us, that we would be peacemakers, because if we are in his kingdom, we are the sons and daughters of Help us, O oh God, to always keep it right with you, God. Help us, O oh God, to keep our minds on you. Keep our minds on you. Open to receive your blessings. Open to receive your correction. Open to eliminate anything that interferes with the peace that we have with you. And then, O oh God, help us to show that peace to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Thank you, Mr. Wood. And the peace of God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will fill your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Right? Philippians 4, 6. Right? Well, we love that part, but how does that apply to you? How will that be applied to you? We love that. What's the beginning of the scripture saying? Don't worry about that. But, but how? How? But with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. There is there's a term there. There's a fine print there. And then it says, and then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding with your heart and mind in Christ Jesus, right? That's why Miss Lewin says that, you know, these people that are, um, you know, the atheists and the <coughs> they don't have peace. Okay, now, I really, really, really believe that. And I, I, those of you guys that admit, when you weren't saved, those of you guys that weren't saved, some of you guys have been saved by your life. But some of you guys weren't. Some of us weren't. Let's say that. Okay? We weren't saved. We were, you know, out there in the world, living in the chaos. And the chaos was awful. The chaos was awful. Let me tell you something. The chaos was bad. I don't miss the chaos. I love the peace that I have now. Does it mean I don't have any problems? I have plenty of problems. But I have peace with the Lord. I have peace with God. Look, I would rather have every single problem, every problem that I could get, it doesn't matter. As long as I'm in a relationship with God, that is good. But having problems without God, that's a different chaos. And you know what I mean. You've been there. Okay? Chaos without God. Can you can you imagine being there? Okay? Three days at the mission I stayed. Albert yeah. helped me out. About three days, something like that. Yeah. Came to the Dream Center, because we had to at 6 p.m., right? We had to get on that bus. I'm telling you, I was in that mission, and not the mission, but my mind was a chaos, because I landed there because of the chaos. It was ugly, I'm telling you. We got on that bus, we come to the Dream Center, and when we were at the Dream Center, everyone from the mission sat on that side, yeah. right? And we faced this side. Yeah. That's where all the preaching, and we have all the, you know, the second facing first pe people on that side. And I saw something that I wanted. I saw that these people had peace. I knew they had problems, I'm sure. But I saw something different from them and from me. I saw the contrast. See? I saw that there was peace there. I saw Pastor Wall preaching, and I saw this peace in him, and I saw the peace in the people that were there. It's, it, and all I had to do was take a step this way and say, God, I want that peace. And I said, God, how do I get that peace? How do I get that peace? How do, why, did they, why do they look like they have peace? What, the, the praise and worship, you know? It's, it was so a different contrast from the mission when I was at the mission because of the chaos that was in here to the first phase, the second phase, and, and so there was a peace there. I could see the veil. And all I had to do was do this, take a step over and pray out and, and call out to Jesus. How long? It took me three more months. I left the mission. It took me three more months to get that. And every day that I was out there on the street, I would remember that vision. I would remember the peace is there. Why don't you go get it? Why don't you go get it? Why don't you call out? You called out. It's right there. Go get it. Until I took that step and I called Pastor Ken. Bless his heart. I called Pastor Ken and I said, Pastor Ken, I'm ready to go in. Open up a bed for me, Pastor Ken. He didn't have a bed that day for me. And I said, God, see, you don't want me there, God. That was chaos. See, God, you, uh, you know how we are when we're not safe and we call out. See, God, uh, I think it was the next day. I was getting ready to do some dumb. Okay. Don't want to talk about it. But I was getting ready to do some dumb. The phone rings and Pastor Ken says, 
Okay, see, we have a bed for you if you want to come in. Man, I fell to my knees and I said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I came into the Dream Center, and when I walked through those doors, it's like they took that step over, and from there on, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, I understand that. Amen. If you've been in the chaos, you understand that. That's the peace that we have. No matter what problem you have, at night, you can go to bed and go to sleep and pray, and God will give you peace. And the next day, you get up, and God will help you. I'm telling you that you have to take that step. Amen? Amen. That's the peace that we have with the Lord. On your feet, please. On your feet. Lord, thank you. Like I said, I really do believe that there are still people here who don't have that peace. You don't, you don't have that peace. There's still chaos going on. There's still, you haven't given it all. You haven't took that step. There's a veil there, right? And you haven't looked over and just stopped it. <coughs> Take that leap of faith. Take that step. There is hope for you. There's hope for me in it. And it worked. All I had to do was call out to the Lord. <clears throat> so right now, let's just... I want to take 15 seconds right now without saying anything to anybody, without talking. And just right now, just focus on God and thank Him for His peace. And if you don't have peace, take these 15 seconds and call out to God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father. I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, as we leave this service today, Father God, thank you for this special message of peace for this year, Lord God. Thank you, Father. Those of us that, those of us that are here that have not taken that step, that leap of faith, of hope, Father God, I pray that you just nudge them tonight. Lead them, Father God, so that they will do that. And for those of us, Father God, who have been blessed, Lord, have been blessed with the peace of God, with your fellowship, Father God. We pray that we share this with others, that we love others, Father God, that we continue to preach the gospel. Anytime we see somebody, Father God, you tell us to go preach the gospel too, Father, that we do that with peace, with love, and with joy, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here, guys. Thanks for the good service. It will be here again Sunday, 5.30 p.m. Everybody in prayer next door. And the peace of God will be on your minds. Amen. 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 Amen.